Welcome back to The Peaks, everyone. I'm so excited to have you on the show because I'm here with my awesome friend, Natasha Case, the founder of Cool House. Natasha, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Before we dive in, can you give everyone a good, quick intro into Cool House? Yeah. So Cool House is an architecturally inspired, unique, awesome uh, dessert company known for our ice cream sandwiches, uh, pints, and bars. Uh, in crazy cool combinations and flavors like brown butter candy bacon, fried chicken and waffle, whiskey lucky charms, and twists on classics like our dirty mint chip made with fresh mint. We started our business by selling out of uh, gourmet food trucks, which we now have in LA, Dallas, and New York. And we also sell from scoop shops here in LA. We have one in Culver City, our flagship, and uh, headquarters is next door, that's where I am today, and Old Town Pasadena. And uh, we also distribute, perhaps the biggest part of our business, about 5,000 uh, grocery stores and uh, you know, alternative retailers, venues, all around the country and now even Asia and the Middle East. Um, so that's pretty much where we are today. I did not know you guys have gone international. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah thank you. It's pretty awesome. Great news. <laughs> when did this happen? Um, it's, sort of, it's definitely been, I think, since the end of last year, early this year. Uh, a lot having to do with a partnership with California Milk. Um, we we partnered with their team, their sales team, their their consolidator, their distributors. So now I believe it's uh, we shipped to Taiwan, Singapore, Philippines, um, working on Hong Kong, Australia, and then we're in Qatar and Bahrain, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Wow, I did not yeah. know this. I'm disappointed. Yeah. I try my best to keep <laughs> up with. Maybe it's just the dessert Instagrams that distract yeah. me. I can't even keep up with it sometimes. <laughs> I'm really glad, actually, that we brought up the international expansion. Because when you were wine to when you guys were just starting, it definitely wasn't like that. Can you tell us about your first experiences at Coachella and then how you built off of that? Yeah. Um, so Coachella was amazing because it, that was all about you know, uh, action, not perfection. And you have an idea, get it out there, seize the moment. We could really see for us that this, um, we call it the brand zeitgeist, that, that perfect kind of storm of, um, there wasn't really artisan ice cream back then in the way there is today. Food trucks were very new on the scene, chef driven food, food trucks and social media was also a very new concept. Um, which is, it's not, it's all not that long ago. So we knew we needed to get out there. Coachella was the biggest event we could think of to do that. 100,000 people, you know, no, no biggie. And um, we had bought a truck for like $2,700 that didn't even drive. So we used our AAA membership I to get out story. there. <laughs> so it's called, it was the ultimate bootstrapping. Um, but it was enough. It was enough to, to you know, to, be the, the, to, put, to have those pieces. We had enough of, I think, the energy, the drive, us, the vibe of the brand that people could catch on. And even though it, it was a much, much different form than it takes today, um, I almost think that's, that's part of the charm. That's, that's your story. And the best brands come from the street. So we built kind of a mini cult following at the uh, campground at Coachella, which is where our, we had our truck. And um, we just really capitalized on it from there. And we sort of were always um, keeping up with, with the hype, you know, which is exactly what you want. You don't want to be, you know, have this super polished brand and then, you know, say, where is everyone? You kind of want to be, oh my God, we're so overwhelmed. There's so much to do. How do we even barely do this? Like that, that is actually a, a pretty good sign for the early days. So yeah, we just, we first, you know, made the truck drivable after Coachella and then pretty much just hit the ground running doing um, uh, festivals, vending, catering, things like that. Just a note on Coachella, too. When you guys were on your way back, Freya, your co-founder, actually thought your social media channel got hacked, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we had gotten a piece. A, a, a friend had graciously written a little blurb on us in Curbed, which he wrote for at the time. And it wasn't even that nice of a blurb. It was like, so this architectural ice cream happened in the desert. Apparently, it's a thing. Maybe you should check it out. I was like, thanks, Dan, for the really <laughs> flattering piece. Um, but it, it went viral. And I can see now how rare that is for that to happen, you know, in anyone's life, um, where it went in one day from Curbed, Eater, Dwell, LA Times, LA Magazine, Angelino. I mean, you name it. I had all these editors calling me wanting the story and, um, Freya, Freya's phone had died. So she turned it back on in the car coming back. And, uh, she, you know, she had the setting at the time where every time we got a new follower, she got an email. So every three seconds she was getting an email and she thought, Oh, we're just going to have to 
you know, clean this out and start over. And when she told me that, I said, no, this is, this is happening. This is real. So by the time we got back to LA, I think we had like 5,000 Twitter followers. It's <laughs> a lot of email vibrations. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> At the time that was a big deal. You know, that was, mm. that was something to start with. That was a, that was an audience. So we knew, we knew we, uh, we, there, there was, you know, more to be done. That was not going to be the last anyone saw of Cool House. <laughs> Can you tell us about what happened when you got back and how you kept going on that hype, like you were saying? Yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning, we're just sort of, you know, saying yes to everything. Um, we, we first just had to make the truck with an operating door, operating window, drivable, but we did kind of the, still the minimum amount. I mean, you should have seen it. Bless that little truck's heart that it was even able to do what it did for us for, I think, you know, two years. Um, and uh, we, you know, we started, we, we, we continued to kind of answer all the media buzz that was really important, you know, to not say, oh my God, we're too busy, we're too overwhelmed, there's no time for this. I got back to every interview and then we started getting inquiries for, for people saying, um, what's it going to take to have the truck, um, you know, come and do an ice cream social for our office? Our first inquiry was from MySpace. That's how long ago this was. And we were sort of like, uh, we have no idea. We hadn't even thought about private catering. We're like, you tell, you tell us. Uh, so I think whatever price we quote them at is like a quarter of what it is today. We just had no clue. But the point is, we just, we just, we didn't know a perfect answer. We just did it. Let's, let's just keep getting the brand out there. Let's get out there every day. Um, let's, let's be part of every festival we can get into. And just really, you know, not look back and not kind of sit in the moment and fret like on all the what ifs. You know, you just sort of put your head in the sand and you just go. And I think it has to be like that for the first few years. I love that point for a couple of reasons. The first one on the media side of things where you're saying always responded to reporters. A lot of times we see companies say, sorry, we're heads down. And you never see press about them. Why do you think it was important to always be getting Cool House in the press? I think, well, first of all, I think also people get their, they only, they're very, maybe very selective with their responses. If it's not a major media outlet, they sort of say, forget it, you know, and that's a really bad way to go about business because you never know, you know, where, who people are going to become, where their path is going to take them. The same way that I know people took a chance on me um, when I would reach out, you know, early on or before a cool house. Um, and a perfect example of that is I was at a barbecue not too long ago with a friend who's um, in the hospitality business as well. And um, uh, we sat down by like the outdoor fire pit and this woman said to me, oh, you're Natasha at Cool House. I've been wanting to introduce myself or, or reintroduce myself. And I said, oh, do we, do we know each other? And she said, yes, I'll never forget you because I was a student at USC and we were doing some research project and you totally were responsive and, you know, gave me a bit of your, of your time to hear your story. We met at the, you know, I think we had even maybe met briefly at the shop. Um, and uh, now she was like one of the head of marketing for Wolfgang Puck. And wow. we're working with Wolfgang Puck already and continuing to grow that account. And uh, it's just, it's perfect. It's a perfect example of you just never know. Now she's the one who, you know, I'm trying to, to beat down their door to get into more Wolfgang Puck. So it's, it's so important to, you know, um, give everyone a chance, an equal chance. Um, and uh, also I will say for us, and it continues to be this way, just press in general. It's just such a huge, huge driver of sales. I mean, people writing a story about you, you're not paying them to do that. It's incredible. And um, sometimes little pieces end up in bigger places or writers pitch it to various outlets that you didn't even know about. And it could always end up being bigger than you thought. So I I just, it's so, it's so important to um, realize what an important role that's going to play in in, in sales and success of your company. I love that. And then the second half of that, which is also related, is you were saying you guys were always saying yes, experimenting with every opportunity that came your way. Yeah. Similarly, a lot of companies think focus, focus, focus. If it's not on our priorities, we're not doing it. Why did you do that in the early days? How did it help? I think you need all those yeses to be out there and see what really does fit the best because you may have an idea in your head of what the right answer is and you really just have no idea. You may think this is a product for moms. Well, maybe it ends up being a product for teenagers. But if you said, you know, no to all those teenage events, you'll just never know that. You know, so you really kind of have to let, um, you know, your, your audience and, your, and certain, demogra- certain demographics choose you as opposed to the other way around. 
Um, you and I were just chatting about our Beyond Yoga partnership, which is a, a limited edition line yeah, that we did with a yoga company. I mean, who would have ever thought, you know, but we saw that there, we have a huge following of fitness and health gurus who advocate something like Cool House, Cool House in particular, on their cheat day. So I would have never, you know, thought of that by design. But you learn things when you put it out there. I will say, too, now that we've been in business seven years, it's okay to say no. It's okay to be more selective because you know your brand identity better. But you really have no clue in the beginning. Can you dive in a little bit more to discovering your brand identity during the early days? Who were your best customers? Who did you think was going to be a customer and they ended up not being? You know, um, we have a very diverse following. I would say at the end of the day, especially if you look at like Google Analytics on our website, you know, the core is millennial, skewed a little female. It's basically women on their iPhones. That's who goes to to our website, you know. Well, welcome, ladies, on your iPhones. Um, But it's pretty even the next older demographic and the next younger demographic. And I'll tell you why. It's because a brand like Cool House is so multifaceted. We have, you know, our food trucks, which then on the streets or at festivals and cater. So the person who's going to be able to track down that truck, um, like on social media is going to be generally a pretty savvy, you know, plugged in person. So often a little bit younger, someone with a little, maybe free time on their hands. Uh, so maybe they don't have a family, you know, potentially maybe they're a single person who knows. So that's sort of, you know, maybe a stronger culture of that part of the business. The catering is not, you know, because it is a premium service. There's definitely, uh, a, a threshold for you know people who can afford that. So that's going to see a little older people who may have a little more money in the bank by then. People who are maybe a little bit higher on the you know food pyramid at, at work, for example. Um, then we have our grocery store product. Uh, the sandwiches are often a younger buyer who's buying like a kombucha and a sandwich. The pints and bars are more family because they're multi pack. And then our shops are very very much families. It's the easiest for people to track down to walk from you know. Mm-hmm locally or to come by after school. So it's such a, it's, it's very diverse. And I think that's great. So you have to, for us, we have to kind of, you know, always keep that in mind that there's different parts of the brand that different people are, are, are taking a piece of. And I think some of the best brands are that way. And that's great. Um, but I would say, you know, it's such a helpful tool, social media, you know, if you're really listening to, um, what your customers have to say, there's so many ways for them to communicate at this day, these days, Yelp, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, just pay attention to what people like. What are people gravitating to? What are people commenting on the most? What don't they like the most? So you really, you can't get kind of stuck in your own way. You really have to be willing to, you know, kind of put down, put your pride aside and just listen. What have you learned by listening to your customers on social media? Um, you know, I think we've learned, um, for example, there's a difference between what people are might be excited about on social media and what they want to buy. So there's um, like, you know, if I put on Instagram, like a crazy looking sandwich, that's a really exotic flavor. People will chatter about it so much, like our Jewish deli line. That was huge, huge social media and PR buzz, which was awesome. And, um, and lots and lots of chatter and excitement. And the actual sales were not that high because it's the kind of flavors uh, and collection that will draw people to taste. But at the end of the day, maybe they just want chocolate chip vanilla and that's okay. There's no, people have vanilla shame. You know, they think they need to go to like anonymous groups to talk about their love for they vanilla. They should because chocolate is way better. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm personally, personally a huge fan of vanilla. It's so delicate, so intricate. Ours is Tahitian, so it's very refreshing. So I think you also have to, you know, there's, there's certain made flavors that start a conversation and get people excited, but there's also certain purchasing patterns. So that's something we've definitely learned by studying what people talk about and also how they act when they, you know, when they interact with the brand. So we're definitely going to dive into the growth aspect. I just have one more question about the social media that you and I were discussing before. <laughs> you guys have done such a great job of really tailoring each social account to my time of day. So when I'm scrolling through Instagram or I'm on Facebook and I see that massive milkshake with an ice cream sandwich and whipped cream all over, I always smile. And if I'm on Twitter and I see an article that you guys just did, I smile. How did you guys create a personality for Cool House that makes me as a follower really feel something? (laughs) Um, Sometimes hungry. (laughs) (laughs) It's awesome. Um, 
I think just having fun and being silly and not taking it too seriously. I think that that for me is like a pillar in life in general. That's really important. You know, things that are exciting, things that are fun, they should be easy to access. So we try not to make anything too intimidating. We don't make anyone feel like an outsider. You know, um, there's a, definitely a lot of whimsy to the captions and the settings. Um, a lot of fun, bright colors. Something that you wanna that you wanna look at, that you wanna just you know, like you said, giggle when you see it. Um, and then you know, again, I think really seeing seeing what are if, you, if there's questions you put on social media, what are the ones that get the most answers? Um, or we do a lot of like contests. You know, which flavor is the, should be the official, I think we're going to do like an official Olympic flavor of the Rio games. Whenever there's a sports playoff, we do our own little playoff bracket with different combinations that represent the team. So, you know, just really giving, people want a chance to be heard. You know, they want to be part of it, not just like, you know, kind of having something, for lack of a better phrase, jammed down their throat. <laughs> When you say, I'm glad that you said people want to be part of something because I could talk about the Instagram post forever. <laughs> but when you guys had your first truck many years ago, there were so many people who wanted to be a part of the brand. They wanted right. to have a truck in their city and to be a part of it physically versus just following you guys on right. social or in the press. How did you make the shift from truck number one or like you said, truck one and a half to <laughs> truck number two and the fleet that you guys have today? Um, so we, we knew that we wanted to grow the trucks at first. Um, we first were kind of scaling in LA. I think either I'll get back to, you know, getting to the other cities too, um, or getting to many cities rather, um, when, when we, when we talk about wholesale, but, um, we knew we, we knew we were having to say no too often in LA and we didn't want to also have, um, even if we could, cram in as many events as possible. There's also wear and tear on the trucks and they require a lot of maintenance. So it was definitely time to grow the fleet. And, um, you know, we didn't have technically enough, um, on, on the, on the books as far as being, being a business long enough, et cetera, to, to go to traditional bank. It was still kind of just the early days coming out of the recession. So from one of our truck manufacturers, he recommended, um, a local lender, that we were able to borrow money from using the, that first truck as the primary asset. And we were also able to do it very quickly. Um, so that's, you know, that was uh, all happened when I think less than a month. And that's what we oh, needed wow. is to be able to, to, you know, just keep going and not be stuck waiting for what really at the end of the day was a small amount of funding to come through. So, but what, what it shows you is that, you know, firstly, um, even small amounts, even though, uh, I think people get deterred, well, I don't want to go all through, through all that to borrow 20 or $40,000, which is, you know, around the, the loan of that, of that size for us. You know, I don't want to go through the hassle just for that amount of money. Well, if you, if you get that amount of money at the right time, it truly is the catalyst for what became much, much bigger growth for the company. The other thing I'll say is, you know, sometimes, I'm a big believer and you never know where certain opportunities are going to take you. And it so happened that this small local lender who mostly actually lent to food trucks and even literally like, like fruit stalls in like wow. open air marketplaces. I mean, we were one of their only, you know, non-Hispanic clients actually at the time, which was really, really cool. Um, they ended up getting uh, partnering with a much larger um, nonprofit lender, micro lender called Opportunity Fund. Um, which, which has been an amazing, um, you know, uh, group to be part of. And when we were still paying off the loan, um, and they saw how much we were growing with that amount of, of funding, uh, cause we immediately started to then expand to New York, Texas with trucks, later our scoop shops and the wholesale, they flew me out to the Clinton global initiative to speak in front of 1500 people about my experience with the micro loan. Um, I did fundraisers with them. And then a couple years ago, they asked me to be on their Southern California board, um, which is amazing to sit on the other side of the table and help find, you know, now people who, who, who need that, that kind of funding and to be able to speak for what a great experience it was. So you just never know, you know, with something like Opportunity Fund, it's a perfect example. It ended up playing a much bigger role, you know, for me in my, in my career, for the brand, in my life. So, um, I think that's, I, I love that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's such a, it's such a cool experience to think that it's all kind of, you know, a mystery and depending on how you play your hand, a, a, something that seems very small can end up being very big for you. And what happened when you guys had that second truck? What type of growth did you experience? 
So we definitely grew um, from, I think, so the first year we were, we did about $100,000 with, you know, our, our, our half truck, as I called it, um, which we thought at the time was amazing. And that was only from April to December. We were like, we're rich, $100,000, you know, <laughs> it's so little cost at the time that it was like, you know, m- amazing margins for a food business in that first year. And then we actually went from that to almost 700000 the second year by scaling trucks oh uh, and then to a little over a million. So it was happening. You were really but, rich. Yeah, right. Exactly. Just piles of money everywhere. Um, but we really, you know, could see that it was going to hit a ceiling. You know, being in all these different cities, remote management, it was so tough. All the laws were so different in each city. And it just was not going to happen for having a fleet, you know, around the country. So we started, you know, thinking of um, let's revisit two channels that we didn't feel we were well suited to in the beginning. One was wholesale. Uh, we just didn't know anything about it. And one was brick and mortar, which when we launched, we couldn't afford. And now we had a better chance for that. So we also knew we needed to raise some money. Um, very fortunately, through uh, a connection uh, um, with my, my dad's an architect and his longtime client is a guy named Bobby Margolis, who had grown Cherokee Jeans in the 90s to just a multi-billion dollar company. Amazing, amazing story. And he and my dad were having lunch and my dad said, you know, um, would you ever go back into business? And Bobby, and I said, this is his words, said, well, you know, I'm bored out of my fucking mind. (laughs) He's one of those, he'll just be having ideas until, you know, his last day on earth. And um, he's like, I I have a fund with my kids. I want to go back into business for my kids. My dad said, we should talk to Freya and Tosh. They just got into Whole Foods. They have this awesome ice cream sandwich company. It's very buzzy. We had three meetings with Bobby and his son-in-law, Dan, who's now my, really my day-to-day partner, runs the wholesale side of the business. um, No way. Yeah. And they, they were amazing. You know, they, they put in uh, about a million um, and uh, we said, we're going to pivot towards wholesale because it's scalable, um, low overhead with lots of growth. And there's an exit potential there if that's what we want. So uh, it was a huge pivot for us. But, you know, it's, I think now looking back, I think, oh my God, wow, what a big, big moment. I never, I try not to like overanalyze things. It was like, this is the right thing to do. This is the team to do it with. Let's just do it. And we kind of like just hit the ground running. And so now we're in these 5,000 stores with 18 SKUs around the country and internationally. So that was definitely, I think we made the right move. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'd love to talk about that distribution on two levels. First, just in the beginning, when you were getting into your first 100 stores, what was that like? Um, the first 100 stores is definitely challenging because you're, you're really, you know, the grocery world is not as much a game of risk taking as you might see with our trucks and our shops, for example, because buyers are generally risk adverse. They want things that are they have a approved, you know, track record, there's data, there's numbers, you're, you're, it's funny when we go out to restaurant meetings for try to get people to sell our products at the restaurant, they kind of want to, they, they usually want to think like they're the only restaurant in the country that, you know, you're going to sell Cool House to. It's like, you just kind of like play to their ego. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so you don't talk about any other stuff when you're in a grocery store, it's the opposite. They want to hear every market you're in and how it's going. And, and it's, it's sort of like so vetted and they don't care about being necessarily, some of them will want exclusives, but that kind of comes later. Um, so the beginning is a lot of convincing because you don't have much to show. You really don't. Um, that being said, I think the beginning days, you can start with some of your strongest, strongest, what will, what will no, like, no matter how big you get, maybe, you know, continue to be your strongest stores ever because you'll pick maybe, you know, your, your best fit, your most local, you, you know, be selective with that first one. Cause like for us, Southern California, Whole Foods, I mean, it's still some of our top, top accounts. Cause those are just really good stores for cool house. Even if we're in target, even if we're now in Walmart, you know, uh, Kroger, Kroger is our biggest account. Uh, yeah, those, those, you know, do great. But, um, we, the whole, starting so strong in Whole Foods allowed us to have a good platform to build off of and to get into our first distributor, which is really how you start to grow. And once, so then your first distributor was Whole Foods, right? Uh, Whole Foods was our first retailer. Our first distributor was UNFI. Got it. So you got into Whole Foods and then was the next store also a Whole Foods? Uh, we got into, we were in about 25 Whole Foods. Okay. It was our first kind of major, you know, chain, so to speak. And then, um... I think we started to get into like all 70 in the kind of SOPAC region. 
Um, and then, you know, and then once you're in the distributor, it's all about what accounts do they have? And all of those are fair game. So then we just, you know, go, go, go from there. Um, so, you know, definitely I think, Southern California is like a, a one of, is, if not our, I would be shocked if that was our most concentrated retailer zone just because like anywhere that you start and anywhere where your brand is headquartered, like kind of that makes sense. It, it often would be. Um, but, you know, I think we were in Utah right away, uh, you know, some stores in Nevada. I mean, you just kind of start, it, it can take off from there. And now the expansion is really totally a different game when you think of store number one and walking in and seeing Cool House to international expansion, 5,000 yeah. stores. For you, what's that experience like now? How are you vetting stores, choosing which markets to go into? I think we're lucky in food. It's one of the last um, categories where you don't really price compare like you would, let's say, with fashion. You know, if you see a, a dress online that you know you can get, at another retailer, why would you buy it from that one when you can, you know, go to another site and find a half off? You're just going to choose by, you know, affordability. With food, people are still, you know, obviously going to the store and people are pretty much only going to want to go to one type of store. No one's going to leave Whole Foods and say, well, I wonder if I can get that sandwich from Target cheaper. I'm just going to like go get in my car now and get it there. You're pretty much shopping where you're shopping. Very it's true. about convenience. So it doesn't really matter that much. And I think that people now expect to have good natural groceries at almost any store. You know, um, Walmart is the biggest retailer of organic, for example. So um, they, you know, you can get great things there. It's just about um, being selective. So it's not been, you know, I, I would say there's ones more from a practical standpoint that, we, that we're saying no to, like Costco. Uh, right now because they just don't sell a lot of ice cream. People stay in the stores for two hours. So by the time they're ready two to hours? Out, melt it off. Yeah, on average, a long time. Oh. And they, they have a really small selection. And Cool House also, because it's such a premium indulgence, it not, it's not the kind of thing you want to have 24 pints of in your freezer. That's terrifying. One is enough. You might just eat the whole thing anyway. So it doesn't really make sense for those kind of, um, what are they called, uh, those kind of stores, a Costco-type store. Um, there's a name for it. I know. I'm trying to think too, and I'm not sure. Yeah. It's yeah. like the Costco's bulk, bulk, of the world. Yeah, bulk stores like that. Once you guys got into those stores, it was such a big turning point because you realized, like you were saying, the wholesale idea did work out. How did you then build the team behind you to take it to the next level? Yeah. So team is like one of the most important pillars of any of this. Your team is your culture. And you love your team. I love, I do love my team there. We have so much fun. We work, we work our butts off and we have a great time. We're a very diverse team. Um, we're very, people just come together, uh, over such a, a, a amazing array of interests and, and, um, style, um, and backgrounds. So it's really, really cool. And I think that it's, there, there's some things that are, I think are scary for people to give up, you know? Uh, if you've been doing all the sales as the CEO of the company, and it's going to be very hard for someone to compete with how well you're able to sell your own brand. But once you find the right people, they, they, you'll learn from them. They'll be so good at selling that you'll think, oh my God, this is, this is even, you know, this is a breakthrough. Um, because there's going to be things that they have a fresh pers perspective on your brand. And also, you don't have to play, you know, there's a lot of aspects of selling that you, you may, if for me, I really like to kind of you know, be more of the good cop and it should be like, it should be like really bad if someone has to, you know, come into your office and mm -hmm. something was wrong. I, 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 I would save that, you know, rather than having to be part of every sort of tricky conversation, you know, you kind of want to play it more at 15,000 feet at a certain point. And, and when you have the right team under you, who's not only you're learning from, who's, who specializes in the tasks that each of those roles um, require because no one can do everything well, you know, you have to be able to specialize too. And when you have that team under you that's specializing and really owning each of those departments, you will be just liberated to fully explode on your executing your vision, your strategy, doing business development, meeting people, being out there, doing all those like just fun, magical things that a CEO should be totally free to fly and do that you're just never going to be able to do if you can't kind of give up some of those 
major tasks or departments in your company. So I really think, I mean, I think that that's completely the recipe for success. And hopefully, you know, for a brand like us, we're still, we're still a pretty lean team, but we definitely only expect to grow from here with more, with more experience and more exciting people. I think the sales aspect of that is really interesting as something that you kind of took. I love that term, the 15,000 feet yeah. area for. Is this story of Cool House now, Natasha, still about Freya and you starting it, or is it about Cool House? I mean, I think the story is something that you'll always have. It's something no one can replicate. You know, people are like, how could you do a cookbook? Everyone has their recipes now. It's not about the recipes. Anyone can, you know, they're simple recipes, really. Um, some of them more complicated than others. But they're mainly, <laughs> it's not about, oh, I, I can make ice cream and you can't. It's about, you know, the story is something that you'll always have. That's your, that's like, it's, it's like the, uh, you know, the, the crown jewels of, of the business. And it's the kind of thing that people are drawn to, especially these days. It's a more, um, you know, the consumer is smarter and more discerning than ever. And people spend twice as long with packaging as they did a decade ago because they're studying it. They're reading about it. They want to know who you are, what you look like, what is it about you. I mean, you really have to be such a face these days. So, I mean, that is really, really key. That being said, I'm, I'm not trying to make it like a brand that, you know, can only be about, you know, um, me as a personality. I mean, that you certainly see that out there, especially with celebrity chefs. Cool House is, 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 has a life of its own, you know? And it's, it's not like if, I think that those kind of brands, they can be limiting because if you can't be a part of something, then the brand has to have legs on its own. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of both, I guess, to answer your question. I love that and how everything has grown. I mean, even in the last year that we've known each other, I've seen so much. Going back to those key roles that you hired for, what were some of the most important team member, not like literally most important team members, but roles or departments that you wanted to fill out so you could focus on the strategy? I really think sales, you know, because when the cash register is ringing, everything's happening. And you have to have people who are going out there and pitching the brand, having amazing, you know, having everything operate perfectly and having, I mean, marketing is linked to sales. So, but even some people just have the cutest marketing in the world. The sales aren't happening. It's not a business. It's a hobby, you know? So I think that that is the biggest, because once the sales are there, that just frees up, frees you up, frees the budget up, creates more budget to really do anything you want. And that's when it gets really cool. Two more questions for you. One on the sales. Can you give everyone one tip that you've learned on hiring amazing sales team members? I think great sellers can sell anything. You know, you look for that, someone cut of that cloth where there's a certain charm um, and charisma and excitement and also hunger. Um, our sales team is very young. It's not like these, you know, people with 10 years experience at Coca-Cola you know, that had this kind of Rolodex of these people. Well, the game has changed these days. It's become much more democratized. You know, they're moving, buyers are a lot younger. They're moving younger, younger people into buying positions. So it's not like you need these old stodgy, you know, I know everyone in the, in the food world types. You know, you can, if you have someone who's a good seller, they will sell your brand. I love that. Second <laughs> one is for you. Now that you're focusing on the big picture, what are your favorite parts of every day? What projects are you most excited about? I really love our partnerships. Um, we've had some amazing ones as of recent. We talked about the Beyond Yoga mm -hmm. partnership. Uh, we just did an awesome one with Frito Lay. They have a dark chocolate covered potato chip. We turned it into an ice cream sandwich. We handed it out from our trucks and, and did all these surveys on how much people liked it. Um, that was really cool. And that was like, a year and a half in the making started yeah. with us sending them Doritos ice cream to see what they <laughs> thought, you know? So once again, things coming from unexpected channels. Um, so I love that aspect. I love for people to be like, what ice cream and, and X, how could that be? And then you show them, they're like, Oh yeah, how could that ever not be? Um, so that's just fun. And it, to me, it really shows that cool house is a canvas for great ideas. It's not just an ice cream company. And then, um, I just love the parts, you know, getting out there and, and meeting people and, and interacting and, how you don't have to feel bad about that. I think some entrepreneurs, they think like they're not at their desk, you know, writing emails and doing this, like they're not doing their job. Like your, your job when, when you're the CEO and you're the founders, if you're going to go and have a beer with someone and, and share stories and 
and just talk about, you know, their business or yours or whatever it may be, that that's work too. And like, that's something that no one else can even really do. Like you're the founder, you have, you have the stories and the true insider info and you really represent the brand. So I love the kind of more informal, social, casual side of things. It's, it's just, it's endlessly fun. Well, you're an awesome representation, and it's <laughs> such a blast to watch. Really, now I feel weird saying blast because I was going to say watch Cool House explode, and now I'm imagining <laughs> a rocket ship. But you're such okay. an amazing example of grow with the way you've led Cool House to be what it is today. I'm so grateful we got to have you in the series. What's the best way for everyone, Natasha, to stay up to date with Cool House, to meet you guys in your different cities and social channels? I would say on eatcoolhouse.com. Uh, you can find out, you know, more about the brand, our retailer near you, truck near you, etc., or any of our social media, uh, which is at Cool House pretty much on any channel, except for Snapchat is at Cool House LA. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.